start by closing your eyes and put an image in your mind of a slave. Now change the image to one of a servant. Open your eyes. Did anybody get a positive image of slavery, a nice one? No, nobody. And that's what we would expect, isn't it? What are our images like? So black people with manacles, 12 years a slave, perhaps child trafficking, modern slavery. This is a parable about a masked and slave relationship. And it's a tricky passage. It's a hard parable. It's in nobody's top ten of parables. And the reason for that is, it's hard with our image of slavery to get into this. And there's a couple of difficult Greek words as well that need properly translating. But today, we're going to claim it back into our armory. You up for that? Yeah. We're going to do that by shining some first century Middle Eastern light upon it. Now, Jesus was telling this parable to his disciples. So Jesus had followers, he had disciples, and he had apostles. Yeah, any time you might have a few hundred followers. We don't really know how many disciples, but we know at least 12, because 12 of them were apostles. Yeah? But what is a disciple? Now, rabbis had disciples. Uh, the rabbi's job was to interpret the Hebrew scriptures and help people to live by them. You know, the devout Jews, to tell them how God really wants them to live their lives. And they would have disciples, a bit like an apprenticeship, except there was no formal structure, but it would be a multi-year type thing you'd commit yourself to. Most rabbis would take A-star students for this. It would be a really prestigious thing to do, to be discipled to a rabbi. But Jesus picked a whole rag bag of people, that's because he always broke through these sort of conventions. These would be young people as well who by the age of 13 would have memorised pretty much everything within the Hebrew scriptures. So his job wasn't to teach them what was in there because they already knew that, it was to interpret it. And you did that by living out in community with your rabbi. So you would help with the communal meals, you'd watch him and you would ask him questions and he would ask you questions about what you do. And in every way you would try to emulate him. Now there was one story of a rabbi's disciple going a bit too far and hiding in his bedchamber at night to see how he pleased his lady. That's going a bit too far. But this was the idea. Now this exciting new rabbi, Rabbi Jesus, comes onto the scene with a fresh way of interpreting scriptures. So for his disciples, it was about how do I put my whole life, my ego, my ethos, my ethics, my morality, my family, my career, all that stuff over to the teaching of this new rabbi. Because what you did was to commit your life to whatever he said. If you asked a question of a rabbi and said, am I allowed to light a candle on the Sabbath? And if so, how many? Okay, that's the sort of question you might ask. Now you talk about that for several weeks perhaps, the rabbi wouldn't come down and make a proclamation straight away. But after looking at all the angles, he'd say, perhaps, Yes, you can light a candle on the Sabbath, but no more than four. And for the rest of your life, as a disciple to that rabbi, you would need to commit yourself to never light more than four candles on the Sabbath. And these sort of wise teachings of the rabbis would be put together in a book called the Talmud, which would help people interpret how to live for God. So we can see, can't we, how the disciples are trying to follow Jesus. They want to give their whole life over to Jesus. I don't think that's really any difference for us today. We become Christians and we say, give your life to Jesus. We've gone from being outside of Jesus' jurisdiction to giving up an ownership of our lives. So that's about disciples, okay? So that's the background. So in this parable, Luke 17, at verse 7, we start. And Jesus comes up with this phrase, suppose one of you... Every time he uses this, he's expecting an emphatic, no, no way, never, that's never going to happen. Suppose one of you's got a servant or a slave who's ploughing or looking after the sheep. When he comes in from the field, do you tell him to hurry up and eat his meal? Of course not. Instead, you say to him, get my supper ready, then put on your apron and wait on me for a while while I eat and drink, and then you may have your meal. You think, hmm, oh, that's a bit tight, isn't it? No, because... Our image is of somebody who perhaps is working out in the fields all day, this sort of slave image, perhaps you're whipping him to make him work a bit harder. 
and then he comes in and the master's led on his chai lounge eating his grapes he says right jump up and get me a seven course meal straight away it's not like that this is an ordinary day for ordinary people suppose one of you is a slave he's intimating that disciples might have slaves hmm well the Talmud says that every normal person has at least one slave so by that interpretation the disciples <coughs> at least some of them were likely to have had slaves or their families would have had slaves so Zebedee James and John's father they likely to have had slaves to look after their fishing business Matthew the tax collector I can't see how he would not have had a slave why could that be though our image of slavery is only sort of upper class people isn't it? or wealthy people having servants and having slaves but when you've got no social security when you've got no charity in a society but whenever you get into debt there's no one to pay off your debt you go to prison no matter how small the debt is you can see how quickly your whole situation could go downhill that's the fact that you couldn't be able to eat yourself you wouldn't be able to feed your children so you could be in a real state so what you would do you'd weigh it all up if you were in a dire situation and you would say oh well my 12 year old he's quite fit and healthy perhaps i could sell him to Zebedee, I know him quite well, he's already got a slave, he'd look after him well. If I sell him and get that money, then I can get myself onto a right footing again and look after them and feed the rest of my family. So it became part of what went on. You never heard Jesus or Paul say abolish slavery. If around today they would, because it's a different type. Jesus said, imagine he comes in and you say to him, don't get my meal first, but you could have a meal yourself. And they would roll back and say, oh yeah, that would never happen. Because they're seeing what they're used to. Now, that's a bit strange too, isn't it? Because you say, well, shouldn't you masters eat with their slaves? You know, well, Jesus did, didn't he? Jesus ate with anybody. That's part of the reason why the religious people didn't like him. You know, they'd say, oh, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And he hangs out with prostitutes and that. They just didn't like that because that wasn't the normal way of things. But it's not too much different today, though, is it? If you say you're a servant in Buckingham Palace, right, so you're preparing all the food ready for a banquet for royal dignitaries. You spend seven hours getting all this food ready, but before the butlers take it up, you walk along to the banqueting hall. There's a space between the Queen and the Prince of Djibouti. You go and sit down, tuck in your serviette, <coughs> and say to the Queen, there's some lovely pheasant on its way. I can't wait to get stuck in. How long are you going to stay in that chair <laughs> before the royal corgi dogs are set on you and chase you back down to the kitchen? It's not going to happen. Jesus goes on to say, you wouldn't thank him for just doing his normal day's work. You think, well, that's a bit, mm, isn't it? Because you'd thank somebody, wouldn't you, if they did a good day's work? But this is the first of those Greek words <coughs> that Luke's got here. The word that Luke normally uses for thanks and thankfulness is not this one. This is Karin. This is the one where Archangel Gabriel appears to Mary and says, you found favour, you found special merit with God. That's the word here. So he's saying that you don't deserve any special merit, any special thanks for doing your normal day's work. Now I've got people work for me and they do a good day's work and then I sign their time sheets I say thank you to them every day. Might buy them the odd cappuccino, you know. That's just the normal life. However, we've also got a rewards and recognition scheme. So if someone goes above and beyond, so if they perhaps cancel a weekend's holiday to do work which gets a power station back online, or recently I had to clear 151 large cupboards of files and get them scanned. And there was dust everywhere in these old files that had been there for 30 years. And these two young ladies did this job for me. And they were coughing and choking away. Above and beyond their normal day's work. So I sent them to a Cotswold Hotel one evening for a massage and a spa. And treated them for what they'd done for me. But if I did that every day, if someone did a normal day's work and I gave them a reward and recognition, the rest of the team would think, what have you done that for? My boss would say, what have you done that for? They're just doing their normal job. And this is what it is here. Jesus is not saying, you don't treat your slave special, give him a bit of a break, just for doing his normal day's work. And then he turns it back onto his disciples and says, it's the same with you. When you have done all you have been told to do, just say, we are blankety-blank servants. We have only done our duty. 
Now, I put the word blankety blank in there because this is a really awkward word. What was read earlier was the word worthless. You are worthless servants only doing your duty. And this word, achreos, gets translated as unprofitable, but it doesn't really fit very well, does it? Because it's saying here then, we take that translation, you've done a good day's work, you've done what's expected of you, but you're just worthless. You might expect extra favour, that doesn't make you unprofitable, does it? You've not gone the extra mile, that doesn't mean you're useless, does it? So, what does this word mean? In a lot of Greek words, you can put the letter A in front of them, and it can mean the opposite. So we have symmetry and asymmetry, which is actually Greek words that we use today. Yeah? It means the opposite. It's not symmetrical, so it's asymmetrical. So if we take the word kreos, the meaning of that word is to need, to have need of something. So akreos means without need. So let's put that into the passage, and it says we are servants without need. We're only doing our duty. You think, well, that doesn't work very well either, does it? Because we've all got needs, haven't we? But let's take that phrase and put it back into the Middle Eastern culture today, anywhere from Syria to Sudan, and you get a different picture. So imagine you're living in a little village out there, and the carpenter from the nearby town is coming through to put a new door of one of your neighbours. And your window is sticking. When he comes by, you grab him and say, oh, you couldn't fix my window, I'll drop by later. When he drops by, it takes him five or ten minutes with a plain bit of sandpaper, and your windows swish again, working perfectly. And you say to him, are you with need? He looks at you and smiles and says, no, I'm without need. You know, what you're saying is, you know, for that little job, do I owe anything to you? Am I in debt to you now? He says, no, no, no. I've done nothing for you which puts me in debt. Just put it on the house. It's just a small thing. You're not in debt to me. I don't expect any payment from you, any special thing. Do you see it? It brings it alive. It says, we are servants that are not in debt. When we do the things we're supposed to do for Jesus, when we obey him out of our love for what he's done for us, we are not in debt for him. There's nothing we can do that could pay for what God's done for us. He's never going to be in debt for us, whatever we do for him, yeah? And you can say, well, okay, I understand that, but I don't know if I really like that picture of a master and slave, Kevin. I prefer the pictures of, like, Father God adopted into his family and hugging me and blessing me and giving me all lots of good gifts. That's a nicer picture, isn't it? And it's master-slave thing. So the question is, that are these two things compatible? That a lad who was at this Baptist church 25 years ago, who became a Christian through our youth work, he's now a Christian in Stratford, and this is what his daughter put on his social media a few days ago. To the most marvellous and wonderful daddy in the whole world. Thank you for every bedtime story, every lullaby, every kissed owie, every waltz around the kitchen, Every day trip somewhere, every tub of Hagen Dahls, for building dens, for the amount you have taught me about myself and how I should respect myself, how I can do anything I put my mind to, for loving me even when I am unlovable, for every time you've said, I'll buy you a new one, <laughs> for every hug, high five, and fist bump, for the shared excitement in a new word. For teaching me how to play guitar, how to ride a bike, how to be undignified and not care, and how to be strong when everything goes wrong. Daddy, you are Superman. I love you so much, and I am so proud of you. And that's the image we like of God, isn't it? Getting down and being there and giving us fisties and playing with us and helping us when we're down and teaching us things. Not this image of master-servant type thing. But they're compatible because in that relationship between Dan and Lydia, as Lydia's growing up, Dan has got responsibility for her, hasn't he? He's owning her. He's, him and his wife, Lisa, they're legal guardians for that girl. And they've got to make sure that their bank accounts are in the black and not in the red, that she's got food on her tables, that she's got a home to go to, and, and she has to be obedient, she's got to learn that, she's got to be disciplined at times. And that's the responsibility of the father, isn't it? We really want that in our lives too. But we've got to understand that no matter how much God loves us, you know, we're adopted into his family, we're still not his equal, are we? You know, we might be co heirs with Christ and his kingdom, but we are not his equals. He's still the boss, he's still our master, and we, we still need to respond to all that love and obey him. But then there's this thing about just doing 
your, your duty and not get anything back because you're just being obedient. What about prayer? What about answered prayer? What about gifts and blessings? Now, please hear me, church. Please hear me. I'm not saying don't pray. I know some of you find it hard enough as it is to pray for yourself and pray for good things. I'm encouraging you to pray. What I'm saying is they're separate things. There's nothing we can do that will put God into our debt. But at the same time, he wants us to be continually praying to him, continually asking him for things, um, seeing answers to prayer, seeing blessings. We seem to think that sometimes God owes us, but he doesn't. You know, we might say things like, oh, that lady, she's such a good Christian. She visited people, but she's died early of cancer. That's so unfair. She, she deserved to be healed. You know, her brother was completely useless. He should have had cancer. You know, he never lifted a finger for anybody. You know, but the truth is, as good as she was, as loving as she was, she hasn't deserved that healing. She hasn't earned it, has she? And the other thing is, we can open up a tab on God's blessings or have higher purchase agreement, can we? There was a guy I met at a wedding once, and I instantly liked him. He was overheard at a conversation between my wife and his vicar's wife. And Jenny was saying, no one has yet invented a tidying up machine. And he went up to them and said, God has, and made a picture of a woman with his, with his hand. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, how come you came to this church? He said, well, I'm a steeple jack. So that's the guys that climb those tall church spires. He said, one day I fell off. And as I was falling down, I shouted out, if you save me, God, I will go to church every Sunday. So here I am. Says. And of course, not there with a calculator, thinking, hmm, every Sunday, if you get a new safety harness, you've got another 40 years, 2,080 Sundays for one life. Yeah, OK, I'll go with that. But if he stops going to church, I'll put him under the next number 12 bus. Yeah. <laughs> you know... It doesn't work like that, does it? Things are separate, you know. God blessed him by giving him new life. It's not to do with how much we've done. We need to pray to God for things and trust him with our prayers. And it sort of releases us in, in a sense as well, because if you come and say, pray for me for this, and we pray hard and we really believe and you're not healed, I don't have to feel guilty about that because I have to trust him with the prayers, don't I? Trust him with the healing, trust him with the prayers. There was a girl who ended up in a wheelchair five months ago. People prayed for her. She had bad muscle spasms and, you know, couldn't walk. A lot of pain. And God didn't answer those prayers. But last Saturday, when she went to the Pentecost service up at the race course, they wheeled her into the service. And during the opening worship period, she was healed in a chair. She got up. You know, she came up on stage and, and shared her testimony. And his timing's great, isn't it? Because then it's not only the people that prayed for her on the first day would have got the blessing. We all get the blessing, don't we? Because they're there to witness that. Let's bring this home. Think about your spiritual life then, all right, and the journey you've been on. So to start with, your spirit is lost, isn't it? It's dragging you down to destruction, really. It's like being a slave in poverty or having nothing. And Jesus has died for you. He's paid that price. And once you realise he's paid that price, he can buy you and he can own you. So you're no longer that slave of sin. You're no longer going to destruction, but he brought you into the kingdom. He is now your master once you accept the payment that he's made on the cross. And at that moment, we're born again on me. The spirit gets reborn in us. That's what it means to be born again. And it's then it's like having your own rabbi. Because the spirit of Jesus is living within you. And he's teaching you. And you're asking him questions. And he's asking you questions. And he's directing you. And you're using his word to see how you can make your life more like his. It's that rabbi within. And out of the love he's done for us, we're responding to him. We're obeying him. At the same time, we're trusting him with our prayers. We're trusting him to bless our lives and give us good things. Yeah? So there's this trusting and this obeying. So in the words of the old hymn chorus, we need to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen.